aware of that. Of course, you can see here on the, the top of our screen, we have the QR signing code. I'm seeing now where oh, I have to figure out how to make my bar disappear on the bottom. <laughs> um, I'll just change the, the format at the beginning. So if you're signing in for CCA Certified Crop Advisors, you want to scan that QR code, it's probably not going to work because it's too low on our screen. So let me go ahead and just edit that really quick for you guys. And then we'll get started. All right, just double checking that we're recording. Yes. Thank you. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, if you're outside of the Pacific Zone area. Uh, welcome to Biologicals and Best Practices for Strawberries. My name is Angela Kaiser. I am the Senior Strategic Marketing Communications Manager at Marone Bio Innovations. Um, and I am so pleased to welcome you to this webinar. Thank you for your interest in biologicals and growing strawberries, hopefully in a more healthy and sustainable way, and um, for being interested, hopefully, in some safety information that we'll be sharing at the end of the webinar. Before we get started, I just want to go through some housekeeping things, and then I will hand it over to my colleagues. So first and foremost, if you are on uh, attending this webinar for credit, we have California DPR credit, we have certified crop advisor credit, and we have the state of Arizona credit. So you can see the numbers there. I always encourage, if you can, just take a screenshot of it. <laughs> uh, it's a good thing to keep on file no matter what. For those of you with certified crop advisors, just open up your camera app and hover the uh, screen over the QR code it should automatically point you to a website. Now, for some people at past webinars, they said they had a hard time. Um, I wanna make sure that some phones, they won't automatically jump you to the website. You There'll be probably a pop-up or a drop-down or something on your phone and you have to click that and then you'll go into the sign-in. So just make sure you see that. Sometimes we're so focused, we don't realize that they're pop-ups, right? Um, if you have any questions or concerns about the credits, I'm usually your best contact. I may refer you to my colleague, Brenda, but don't be afraid to reach out and ask me. Um, we will be issuing, we will issue a survey at the end or a quiz at the end of this webinar. It'll also be in a follow-up email you need to make sure to take that quiz no matter what. If you're getting credit, you need to take the quiz because that's where we capture your license information and all the information we need to give you a certificate of attendance, okay? So just make sure you take that quiz and then we will deliver certificates within about a week of the webinar, okay? I just wanna quickly go over our safe harbor statement. I'm not gonna read this, but many of you may know that Marone Bio Innovations is a publicly traded company. The information in this webinar is for, for educational purposes and should not be used uh, to determine if you'd like to purchase stock in the company. We encourage you to do your own due diligence and uh, make choices based off of your personal preferences, not this presentation. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers. So we have an amazing lineup of speakers today. Um, you've got some great experts that you can tap into to uh, ask questions and get all of your concerns answered. And the first one is my colleague, Taylor Hoover, who's the Territory Sales Manager with uh, Marone Bio Innovations. He's based over in the Central California coast area and has a lot of knowledge and experience growing strawberries. So if he's not addressing one of your questions or concerns, please don't be afraid, don't be shy, ask, ask away. That's what we're here for today. So a little bit about Taylor. He brings nearly a decade of crop management experience to his role at Marone Bio. He spent five years with Farm Fuel Incorporated, a leader in organic soil inputs uh, to control soil borne plant pests with expanding responsibility from field technician to research and consulting manager to eventually general manager. He then spent time at Acadian Plant Health, a producer of proprietary marine plant extracts for crop health. 
As a key account man manager before joining Marone Bio Innovations, um, he I'm, I'm sorry, he was a key account manager at Acadian Health before jo joining Marone Bio. So Taylor joined us in the spring of 2020, so right in the middle of COVID. So he's had quite a fun journey starting a new job with a new company um, during COVID, but it's really done uh, amazingly well and, um, and is out in the field on a regular basis to help our, our customers out. So Taylor has a, a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture and Environmental Plant Sciences with a concentration in Fruit Science from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. He is also a seasoned cannabis grower, having grown for over 10 years. So any of you out there that have, have a little bit of work in the cannabis area, you can also uh, tap Taylor for those questions. All right. Our second speaker, our guest speaker today is Dr. Zara Sukhoff, and she is the entomology program leader at Cal Poly uh, Strawberry Center. Dr. Sarah Zukoff joined the Strawberry Center at California Polytech State University in September of 2020 as a new research entomologist and the entomology program leader. Prior to that, she was the research and extension entomologist and associate professor at Kansas State University. At Cal Poly, her lab focuses on applied entomology in strawberries. Sarah holds a BS and an MS in biology entomology from Georgia Southern University and a PhD in plant, insect, and microbial science. Her current research interests revolve around improved IPM and resistance management of insects and mites in strawberries. So welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much for being on as our guest speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Melissa O'Neill. Many of you may be familiar with her. She is our head honcho, also known as the Senior Product Development Manager for the West Coast. Uh, so she covers all of the California crops and down into the Southwest. Uh, so Melissa has served in her current role at Marone Bio Innovations as a Senior Product Development Manager for the Southwestern United States since June of 2014. Prior to that time, she worked as a PCA and CCA at Booth Ranches and was formerly an employee of Dr. Beth Grafton Cardwell's Citrus Entomology Laboratory, jointly stationed at Lynn Cove Kearney Agriculture Research and Extension Centers. Melissa holds an AA and AS degrees from the College of Sequoias, a BS in biology from Fresno State, and an MS in agriculture from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Her doctorate is in education, and that is from California State University, Fresno. Melissa's current research interests include entomology, plant pathology, plant health, and weed science. She is also involved with investigations centered on issues affecting women in science, technology, mathematics, and engineering, also known as STEM, um, and the importance of STEM education in overall student success. So Melissa, thank you so much for being on another one of our webinars. Really appreciate your expertise. And then lastly, we have my friend, my, uh, David Gomez from Gar Bennett, and he is going to be covering the last, the second hour of our webinar today on laws and regulations. So David grew up in Sanger, uh, California, where agriculture was a way of life. His parents were field workers, and it was through them where he developed a passion for agriculture and all it stood for. As a teen and in his early 20s, David began harvesting grapes, driving tractor, and applying pesticides. While working in the fields, he also attended West Hills College in Lemoore, where he planned to major in agriculture engineering. Unfortunately, his college experience was cut short as he was needed for full-time work to help his family out financially. His work experience has included working in packing houses and on farming operations, gaining hands-on experience and learning a lot about worker safety. David has been with Gar Bennett as a worker safety trainer for two years and absolutely loves it. So David, thanks so much for being on again today. You've got a great presentation lined up for us and um, we're all looking forward to it. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to my colleague Taylor, who's going to explain a little bit about Marone Bio. If this is the first time you've been on one of our webinars, we'll tell you a little bit about the company and then we'll get right into the heart of the webinar, which is information on growing strawberries. Taylor? Thank you, Angela. If you don't mind, I'd like to um, just do my own, uh, share my own screen here. Oh, sure. That actually makes it easy for me. All 
All right. Thanks, Angela. Um, as Angela mentioned, my name is Taylor Hoover. I'm the uh, the California Coastal Rep for Marone Bio. My territory is from Ventura to the Watsonville Gilroy area, um, only on the coast. So um, if you are, you know, south of Ventura, your your Marone Bio Rep is going to be Brian Guest. I get a lot of calls, uh, confusion there. Um, as a company overview, uh, Marone Bio was founded in 2006 uh, by Dr. Pamela Marone. Uh, we went public in 2013. Uh, our, our current CEO is Kevin Helash over there on the right. Uh, our headquarters are found in Davis, California with all of our manufacturing in Bangor, Michigan. We have nationwide sales and technical support as well as a global distribution. We've patented over 450 strains of bacteria and fungus worldwide, really showing the devotion um, and, and discovered over 18,000 different species, just really showing the devotion uh, uh, to sustainable agriculture that Marone brings. And, um, you know, it's, it's an overall great company. So we have a really broad, uh, ever-growing broad portfolio. Um, on the left is all of our crop protection products, which we'll be talking about many of them today. Uh, those are our uh, fungicides and bactericides, as well as some insecticides there. And then we've also started to get into some crop health and crop nutrition products as well, which we won't be talking about too much today. So I'm going to start off my presentation uh, with just discussing soil-borne diseases and plant health in, in light of strawberry production. And I'm going to start off by talking about Phytophthora. Uh, obviously, there are many different diseases, uh, soil-borne diseases in strawberries. Many of them um, act very similarly in the soil and show very similar symptoms. And many of them have the same control uh, recommendations from uh, our product perspective anyway. So I'm going to talk about Phytophthora mostly because I have a grower trial that I'm going to show to you guys today. So there are many species of Phytophthora and Phytophthora is an oomycete and that is basically a fungus that can, um, you know, in, in layman's terms, I should say, is a fungus that can uh, swim in water. It can actively move through water. Uh, so you're going to find Phytophthora in any sorts of low um, low spots in the field where there's poor drainage. Is, it's really common to find Phytophthora. Some of the, uh, the symptoms are stunted leaves and plant collapse, uh, brown discolorated crowns, and uh, black and brown root rot. This is really particular to any sort of root disease. Um, you, you would very easily mistake this for charcoal rot or macrophemina, possibly even verticillium in the field. So it's really important to send in samples for lab testing. So with that, um, I just want to touch a little bit about the best practices for sampling. Um, on the left is the first uh, symptoms of the disease. It's best to pull a plant and sample right now at this point rather than later. Because, and the reason for that is because many uh, saprophytic fungus and bacteria will colonize the rhizosphere. And what a sapro, uh, saprophyte is, a saprotroph is, excuse me, is a fungus that is, uh, or an organism that survives on decaying plant matter. And there are several different species of these uh, saprotrophs. And if you're sampling at the uh, third picture or fourth picture here, what's gonna happen is you're gonna show up positive for a lot of other types of fungus and bacteria that have started to colonize that, right, that root zone. And so you'll see macrophemina and verticillium, even though they may not be problems in, uh, throughout the rest of the field, there could be subspecies and things like that that are gonna show up on the tests. So that's why it's important to really test early um, in the first signs of the symptoms. So before I get too far ahead of myself into the grower trial, I want to introduce some of the products that we did use during the, uh, those trials. Uh, the first one is our newest biofungicide called Stargus. Stargus is our only living bacteria product. 
It's a Bacillus amylocathation strain 727. That's actually being reclassified as a Bacillus nakamari. So it is a novel strain of bacteria uh, that tends to colonize uh, the, root, uh, the root zone as well as the, uh, the leaf of the plant. Uh, the application rate here is two to four quarts per acre. However, talking in terms of soil applications for strawberries, my recommendation is to go that full four quarts or one gallon per acre every 30 days to really keep the uh, competition heavy for pathogens um, and keep the population of the living bacillus act as active as possible. It has a frat code uh, that was recently changed in 2020 from 44. The new frat code is uh, BMO2, which is just a bacillus frat code, meaning that it has no known resistance to any sorts of pathogens and falls into the bacillus code um, with unlimited applications per year. Uh, I mentioned that it can be used both in the soil and foliarly. So I will mention some of the uh, diseases that can be used um, in the next slide. Um, it has a signal word of caution and it has a shelf life of 18 months. It doesn't require any special sorts of storage requirements, um, no cooling or anything like that. And it's a highly tank, uh, tank mix compatible product. Um, I'm actually gonna skip that slide for now and talk about um, some of the diseases it does cover uh, for strawberries. Uh, we can cover uh, on the label, it has Rhizoctonia, Pythium, Phytophthora, where some of the diseases that were on the label since last year. As of July of this year, we have added foliar sprays to strawberries. So now it's including Alternaria, Anthracnose, and Botrytis. Uh, this product works great on those diseases as well. So I'm going to go back and talk a little bit about why Stargus is so effective against Phytophthora. Well, let's take it to the lab setting. And up on the upper left here, you'll see a picture of a Petri dish uh, with untreated Phytophthora capsaicae in it. And you'll see the mycelium growth um, kind of going out from that center point of where the Phytophthora was inoculated in the Petri dish. And then over on the right hand side, you will see a uh, dimethromorph, which is the positive control. So that's a guarantee that it's going to kill everything on the Petri dish. And what we see here working from left to right is uh, extremely high doses of Stargus down to a uh, below label rate. So this first, this first dose is slightly over max label rate. We got 100% control of the Phytophthora mycelium. Um, about max label rate, we're still seeing full control, and then lowest label rate, we're still seeing uh, full control of that as well. Um, this is slightly below label rate. We're talking like probably one quart per acre. Um, so that's uh, where you're starting to see definitely still suppression there, but uh, you're starting to see some of that mycelium growth. So even looking at it at a labs uh, setting, Stargus is effective against Phytophthora. So uh, the next product I want to discuss real quickly is JEDAG. JEDAG is our other biofungicide. It's more of a sanitizing product. It's a broad spectrum fungicide, bactericide, and algicide. This product can be applied both in the soil and foliarly. Uh, the active ingredient in JEDAG is a peroxyacetic acid or paracetic acid. Uh, the acronym for that is commonly referred to as PAA. The mode of action of JEDAG is oxidation. So it uses hydrogen peroxide to essentially penetrate cell walls. And then the it allows for entry of acetic acid into the cell, which essentially oxidates and dries the cells out. So basically anything that's living, it's going to come in contact with this PAA product is going to die. And that's why it's so effective against fungus and bacteria and algae. Now, that being said, it does have a danger label, so it requires extreme caution when uh, handling the, the raw product. And there are some compatibility concerns, uh, such as you don't want to be using this with any copper sprays uh, or after directly following any copper sprays, as well as sulfur, uh, magnesium, and zinc. So this is not a product I'd recommend throwing in a tank uh, or in a fertilizer mitt uh, in a tank with uh, micronutrients, uh, foliar micronutrients, or in a fertilizer tank, um, 
through a soil injection chemigation. Uh, so JEDAG's unique, uh, PAA is kind of a commodity product now, but JEDAG's unique in that it has a broad use label all on one label. So you can make applications to soil, um, foliar applications. It's labeled for SWD or spotted wing drosophila control, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and it, it's also used, can be used for hard surface sanitation to control um, just human born or human pathogens, as well as just disease spread through uh, harvest crews and things like that. So to jump right into the grower trial, I know I'm moving kind of quickly, but I got to get through this. Uh, this grower trial was done in Santa Maria on Big Sur variety of strawberries. There were essentially three treatments, uh, approximately five acres each. Each of these uh, areas were heavily infested with Phytophthora the year before. They did fix a lot of the drainage issues that they were having from the prior year prior to this, but they still had high levels of Phytophthora inoculation, inoculum throughout the field. So the first treatment, we just wanted to go with the grower standard, which was a uh, actinovate and regalia pre-plant dip. And the grower would follow up with actinovate maybe every 30 to 60 days uh, through soil injection. And then uh, our next treatment was regalia pre-plant dip, followed by a one gallon per acre of JEDAG. And then 14 days later, um, the JEDAG, I'm sorry, was applied after planting. And then 14 days later, after that JEDAG application, we did a gallon per acre of Stargus. And then the third treatment was just Stargus at one gallon per acre. And here's kind of what we saw. So this is a drone photo of the grower standard. And what we're seeing is that uh, mortality was about 10%. Um, you know, I think it was like 8%. And you saw pretty slow growth. Uh, plant vigor was not as good as the other treatments. Um, smaller plants, things like that were, were noticeable. And then if we take a look at the full program, JEDAG, Regalia, Stargus, uh, what you're seeing is a plant stimula uh, stimulating response where there's a little bit more growth in the plants, uh, far less mortality. I think mortality was down to about 4% through this one, uh, through this treatment. And um, you can just see that the shoulders, everything much more uniform and, and greener and healthier. The plants are starting to touch each other. They're growing faster. And then as for the Stargus alone, it was about equal to the grower standard uh, with about an 8% uh, mortality rate, uh, which should be expected with, you know, less products in the tank. So that kind of concludes what the grower study, uh, the grower trial was. And with that, I think I'm going to hand it over to uh, Dr. Zara Sukoff for her presentation on uh, insects, and then I'll be back to talk about some of our insecticides. So, Sarah, if you would. Well, Sarah's, well, Sarah's transitioning to her slides. Um, if there are any quick questions for Taylor on soil-borne diseases, you can go ahead and just pop them in the, the chat. We're not sure about the background music. We've been checking. Nobody has background music on, so I apologize for those that Those that we're dealing with a little bit of noise. OK, I'm not seeing any chat, so we'll go ahead. Any questions? So we'll go ahead, Dr. Sarah, and then we'll again, after Sarah's presentation, we'll stop again for another opportunity to ask questions. Just make sure to put your questions in the chat so we can make sure to uh, catch everyone that that might have. A need for some information. Go ahead, Sarah. All right. Can you guys see and hear me OK? Yes. Fabulous. OK, so I was going to talk about some of the best practices for strawberry IPM, um, a few of the trials that I've been able to do uh, and a couple things that I've learned along the way. So uh, as as they said earlier, I'm new to the Strawberry Center. I've been here for exactly a year, <laughs> um, and so I'm happy to be able to share some of the things that I've learned and some of the data we've been collecting. So when I ask growers what the biggest problem uh, for their strawberry fields is it's usually um, for insect wise it's usually lygus I hear that a lot and so I want to start off talking about lygus bugs 
Um, and so in this picture, you can see the typical damage that Ligus actually incurs called cat facing. It's a deformity, obviously, we're all familiar with. Um, but what I wanted to point out is that Ligus actually does feed on the akenes, the actual seeds themselves, as well as the flesh around the seeds. And so if you look at that middle bottom picture, you'll see that little nymph sitting there feeding on those, um, those seeds. Now those seeds are already developed. Um, and so that's why when we look at cat face fruit that's been uh, deformed by Ligus bugs, the seeds are more uniform. And you can see these kind of throughout these pictures. Uh, they're, they're mostly the same size. Um, and so what happens when they feed on the seed, it kind of keeps the plant from um, actually developing the fruit around that seed or actually the akene. Um, and so that's what causes that damage. And so there is other damage that we see um, that also causes cat facing. And so, and I also want to point out that all these stages of Ligus feed on these. Now they'll also feed on other parts of the plant as well. And so I wanted to also point out uh, poor pollination because that gets confused a lot. And there's been some, some growers that I've worked with that have sprayed for poor pollination problems when they didn't really have any Ligus problems. Uh, some folks will, will do their sprays based on the cat facing deformities that they're finding in the field, not necessarily actual Ligus. Um, and so it's a good thing just to kind of look closely at the, the damage um, to make sure that it's really Ligus or if it's something else, if it's caused by climate poor pollination or, or any other factors. And so you can see in these pictures, the akenes are very, very small uh, compared to some of the other ones. In here, you can see the, the big ones versus the small ones. Um, and in that third picture, you can really see the difference there in those uh, akenes. And again, that's poor pollination uh, versus the Ligus bug. So we have uh, some options for Ligus uh, in terms of integrated pest management. Here in California, we use bug vacuums, uh, and there's a couple different versions of those um, floating around California. Some have one barrel, some have two barrels uh, for each row with various levels of suction uh, potential. Um, usually we shoot for around, I think, 55 miles per hour uh, suction speed. Uh, and so that seems to work pretty good. Uh, a lot of the growers really like using those. Um, and we actually do have a parasitoid wasp, which you can see up in that top right-hand corner that has established here uh, in California. But the problem is, is that a lot of the eggs for Ligus are laid in the actual berry. And so you can see on the right hand side, that's the um, the stem of the of the plant. You can see those those eggs there. But when given a choice, they really like to lay eggs on the actual berry. And so they'll lay them inside in between those developing akenes. And it makes it really hard for those um, parasitoid wasps to get in there and find them. And so when they when they do that, those those parasitoid wasps just don't do a good job controlling Ligus. And that's why they're here, but we still have problems with Ligus. Um, and so we're still looking for ways to deal with that and we'll we'll continue to talk. So some of the challenges that growers face uh, with Ligus is um, actually pesticide resistance. And I love this little graphic that Surendra Dara had made. Um, this is basically what how they armor up against uh, different things that we throw at them insecticide wise. And, um, and so that's a big problem. We have a lot of insecticide uh, resistance and I'll talk a little bit about more about that. Um, but here in California, what we have is we have ditches that are full of weeds. And one of the management tactics is to um, to spray out your weeds or cut your weeds prior to um, uh, the ligus actually migrating into the strawberries. You can see the strawberries uh, in the hoops there in the background. But one of the issues with this is um, a lot of farmers like to keep their ditches uh, because they have lots of predators and bees in them as well. And so there's this trade-off uh, between getting rid of your ligus um, by 
by getting rid of these extra plants growing around your fields versus um, keeping them. And so here in California, everything dries out during the later later summer, and that's when all the ligus migrate down from their other favorite hosts from the hills and get into these valleys um, in mass. And so when the hills dry down and turn brown, that's when we see this big influx of ligus into our fields. And again, a lot of farmers are struggling with how to deal with ligus and pollinators and their predators. So this is something that I'll continue to look at. So one of the things that uh, farmers have started doing um, to, to try to get rid of their ligus is either they'll, they'll shift from harvesting for fresh market uh, to more of a processing market. And so they'll do this um, and that'll kind of help cut down on the amount of sprays they have to do, but they, they still have to harvest it. The harvesting interval just goes down a bit more. Um, and then they also mow it down. Um, so mowing is also a common practice here in California. And generally in August, we start to see this happening, this transition, because that's when ligus numbers really start to tick up um, into August, into September sometimes. If a grower can, they'll keep it until December in the Santa Maria area in particular. But um, this year has been a light ligus year, but in the past I've heard lots of folks had to destroy their crop um, in, in the August, September time. So um, I did want to share uh, some of the cost estimates for ligus bugs in California in particular. So this is done by Tim Delbridge and this is this is not published yet. Um, so it's a project we're working with him on uh, and he's an economist here at Cal Poly. And so this is the average trays per week lost to ligus bugs and this is in the thousands and it's over the different weeks of the year and you can see in the different areas in Oxnard, Santa Maria, Salinas, Watsonville, how that changes over time. Um, with the ligus influx. And so it's a major, major loss um, that these growers are dealing with. Now here is the amount of uh, cost associated in the past with pesticide uh, use for ligus. And so this is again the, the different growing regions and the top line is the state total. And this is in millions uh, per year. And so the cost of ligus you can see it's, it's pretty much gone up and up. <laughs> Um, and so I don't have the numbers, the recent numbers, but uh, it's probably, it's not any better. I can, I can definitely say that. So because we're talking so much about ligus, I did want to share a little bit of the data that I was able to collect on ligus. We did three trials this year in grower fields um, in Santa Maria. We did not have the populations in Ventura or Salinas to be able to do ligus trials there yet. Um, and we also collected populations to test for resistance. So that data is not quite ready yet. Um, but I did want to put a shout out to all the growers out there and PCAs. If you do have ligus in Ventura and um, the Salinas area, I do need samples from those. So please contact me so we could get those um, regions on the map. So we were able to look at uh, thiamethoxin, um, a thiamethoxin plus bifenthrin, uh, bifenthrin alone, fluconamide, nilid, a soybean corn oil mixture, um, flupyridophorone, and sulfoxiflor, and of course our untreated check. And we use the max rates of these because we know we have resistance issues. Now, this wasn't a long-term study. Um, like I would like to do multiple multiple sprays and, and keep up with cat facing, uh, but because we had we wanted to try sulfoxiflor. It's actually currently not labeled in California, so we're help we're hoping to get some more data to to get it labeled um, in permanently in California. So that's that's being considered right now. All right, so we just had 30 foot plots. Um, they weren't very big, but we were able to have 300 foot rows um, in between, and we had two unsprayed rows in between. So the grower gave us a lot of a lot of room for this, um, which was really really nice. So we had to pull our first sample. Um, we had a couple of tractor issues that we had to deal with. So uh, it started off with a lot of ligus. We started off with around 14 ligus per 20 plants. Um, and so after we sprayed, that's the, the one day prior to treatment, then the next sample is one day after treatment. All of these went down 
and so um, this is this is what we see sometimes when we have a lot of migration and this is again the problem with small plot trials um, is we the adults can move um, and we actively see them moving out of the field and so we did see by day uh, six after treatment um, that we did see them start to go right back up again and there was no significant difference in any of these treatments uh, so we're, we're looking into this area Santa Maria to, to really define the resistance that we have in those areas or to see if it's if it's something else now the 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 nymphs of the ligus can't exactly uh, run away uh, and fly away so we didn't see that big exit um, that we saw in the beginning with the with the um, adults and so we did see a little bit of a difference here um, what ended up uh, being the best at six days after treatment was belief um, and sequoia and so that's a floor and so we are we are interested in getting that labeled permanently for california Oh, I wanted to now talk a little bit about spotted spider, two-spotted spider mite. Um, it's something that I've worked on for a long time and I enjoy working with them, but I always uh, give the farmers heart attacks sometimes when I, when I show them some of the data that I've been collecting in their fields um, because we do have a lot of resistance popping up with um, two-spot. And so there are other mites, of course, in strawberries, and I really won't be touching on those today just because we don't have a lot of time. Um, but so I did want to mention, of course, that two-spot, we do have two uh, or a couple different color morphs. Um, they can be red, they can be brown or blackish, um, and it just depends on, on the population. So we see those different color morphs from time to time. Primarily what we see is just the, the regular green two spots though. And of course that's typical damage we see in strawberries. That was um, in one of my trials in the control where um, the farmer would, would not want to see that of course. So one of the things we do here in California with um, two spotted spider mite control is release predatory mites. Uh, and so one of the things I wanted to mention about IPM of, of spider mites is use of predatory mites and the proper use of this. Um, so this is being tweaked um, as we get more data, but generally uh, the rule of thumb is if you have low spider mite pressure in the fields, usually a two to three uh, predatory mites per plant is what you're shooting for as a rate. Uh, if you have really high pressure, then five plus per plant is really what you're going to need and expect there to be a little bit of a lag because it takes them a week or so uh, to really get going to help manage those, um, those spider mites. And remember, of course, to release in the morning. Uh, I've been working on some quality issues going on with um, predatory mite releases uh, on some of the farmer sides, the, um, the, the company sides and shipping, all sorts of things. And, and one of the things that's very important is to release um, in the morning and also release within the first 24 hours if possible. We've seen um, a 50% loss of, of predatory mites uh, in, in the containers if they have to wait in and uh, not get put out. Um, and remember to store these at about 65 if you can and open them on arrival because those ice packs will get warm and then it just stays warm in those boxes. So those are just some of the things we've seen. Another thing we've been noticing um, is that, of course, spider mites are usually not really killed by neonicotinoids, but the, the predators, these predatory mites, are killed by, by the uh, neonicotinoids. And this can persist for a long time in strawberries. We're, we're testing to see just how long it does last, but it can last uh, for months sometimes. And so be mindful if you're having to spray neonicotinoids, um, then you're, you're going to be releasing predatory mites. I know a lot of the growers and PCAs try to wait about seven to 10 days before releasing, but what we're finding is that's, that's not good enough. It's still, um, they're still active on the plant. And so um, that's, that's something we need to continue to work on. Of course, neonics are on the chopping block, so we'll see what happens with that. Um, and also be careful with other broad spectrum insecticides uh, because these do have sublethal effects on the predatory mites. Um, you won't notice it right off the bat, but they'll have less um, they'll lay less eggs, they'll, they'll eat less spider mites. There's problems that, that go on with that. So be very mindful if you have to spray any of these broad spectrum insecticides while you're releasing predatory mites. 
Um, and I did want to mention that there are a lot of different predatory mites that can be used in California strawberries. There's there's um, five or six different companies at least um, that offer different species. And this is a uh, chart that just shows whether they will eat two spotted spider mite, uh, whether they will eat um, the cyclamen mite and um, the other mites that we have here and thrips as well in California. And so here's just like a handy little chart um, that you can refer back to. And uh, they're also, they, different, they have different temperature um, needs. And so just be mindful of that if you are releasing um, at certain times of the year. There's some that really can't handle a very cold temperatures and that's kind of a major inhibitor. There's some that during cold temperatures will go out and hide and then come back out when it's warm. So uh, knowing the behavior a little bit about these will help you pick the right predatory mite for your field. Um, and of course, preventing spider mites, we just don't want to use uh, pyrethroids because they'll flare spider mites. We want to rotate modes of action. We want to spot treat hot spots uh, and edges near dirt roads instead of broadcast sprays. Micro sprinklers are a really great thing to use. Um, a lot of farmers have started going to them. Uh, and so um, we just want to try to use those if we can. Micro sprinklers are not uh, cheap, so but it does help wash off the dust and helps establish those predatory mites a lot better. Um, so we did a spider mite efficacy trial, and I'm going to run through it just real quick because I want to point out something. So what we did in the beginning is we had acromite, agromech, fujimite, canamite, oberon, and an untreated check. And what we saw is that Oberon was, was the only thing that really kind of helped over time after 21 days. We are seeing a lot of resistance in this. We're finding in our other studies. But I did want to point out this heat wave that came through. This is a, a graph down here on the right of a temperature uh, fluctuation. It got really hot for a few days, and we really saw a bump in spider mites um, in our treatments. And so overall, nothing worked great. Um, that's not very surprising considering the data that came out from Doug Walsh and Kunli Adesanya. And uh, they actually found severe, uh, very high resistance levels for bisymphenazate um, and some of abamectin and some of the other the chemicals. And so we're continuing their work and we're actually working with them uh, to see what else we can find and figure out what works best for the different areas of California. And another thing I wanted to point out was the spider mite um, eggs that were collected in each of these per 20, 20 leaflets, um, they steadily declined over time. And this was um, not surprising considering that um, in the field next to us, predatory mites were released. And so we tried very hard to keep these predatory mites out of our field <laughs> during this trial, uh, but that they were they move very fast. They can move a quarter of a mile in, in 48 hours. And so um, it, it's not surprising that they came over onto our, our trial. Um, and so this was the numbers in each of the treatments um, of the predatory mites. And so they really did a number on those eggs in our trial, but that's great. That's great news for farmers. And that's why I wanted to point that out. Um, one last thing I wanted to mention is that uh, spider wing Drosophila. Um, you know, it's a problem that spots, it comes up periodically. And just a reminder that there are vinegar flies and there are spotted wing Drosophila out there. Um, you have to have a hand lens to be able to tell these apart. We have some folks who were um, finding flies and, and not doing a good job of looking at the identification and they were spraying vinegar flies, um, which are only uh, infecting ripe to very overripe fruit. Um, they like the overripe best. Every now and then they'll go for uh, something that's not completely um, ripe. But the spotted wing Drosophila loves uh, just barely unripe to ripe fruit because it can saw its ovipositor in there and lay those eggs in there and they're protected. Um, so the males you can only tell uh, apart by looking at their wings. The, the spotted wing Drosophila of course have spots and the females or and the, the males of the vinegar flies do not. But again, you have to really look close at these. Um, and a good thing to do, uh, of course, is sanitation. And it's it's a matter of labor and cost to do this. Um, but in this situation, you can see in this picture, uh, this was a, a farmer that was able to take the, the bad fruit out of the field, and then it was dumped at the edge of the field. And so just know that these spotted wing drosophila can fly 
um, uh, quite a distance, um, up to a mile sometimes, depending on the wind currents or the wind um, speed. And so they can they can really move around between fields. Uh, and so if you if you dump your your strawberries this close, they're definitely going to go and reinfest your other strawberries. And one of the ways you can monitor for spotted wing Drosophila um, is putting out a simple vinegar trap. And so if you if you if you have a hand lens and you can look at these, um, it's just a simple cup with apple cider vinegar in it works really well. Um, and if you don't want to have to dig through the apple cider vinegar, then put a little sticky trap in there uh, and then you can just take your hand lens and, and take a look at what you caught. Um, and this really helps you um, not figure out what the, the population is in a field, but it does help you figure out once they're starting to come into your field. And so it's just a really cheap way of monitoring for them. Um, and so this is my information. Uh, hopefully you can see it down there at the bottom. You guys uh, can contact me for for anything, anytime. Um, we'll have a lot more data to come. Um, and so uh, be looking forward to meeting more of you as, um, as I explore and do research around California. So that is it for my presentation. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah. We'll transition back to Taylor. And in the meantime, are there any questions for Dr. Zukoff? We'll just give it a second in the chat. Does anybody see any questions? I'm seeing this meeting chat is muted, so I'm not sure if there's questions that anybody else sees. I'm not seeing any, so we'll go ahead and continue on. OK, then I will go ahead and continue um, just kind of talking about some of uh, to piggyback off of what Dr. Zukoff was saying. Um, about some of these pests that we have in strawberries. I want to piggyback with that with some of our products that we have to offer and some of the best used practices for those uh, particular pests. So the first product I want to talk about is Grandivo WDG. And this product is great and widely used for ligus uh, and spider mites in in strawberry production. The active ingredient is a chromobacterium subsugae as well as um, spent fermentation media. And so this is a non-viable uh, bacteria, meaning there's no living bacteria in this product. So no, no storage issues or concerns about killing this bacteria in the field. The label will say that the application rate is between one to three pounds per acre. I would argue that realistically it should be a two to three pounds per acre uh, in strawberry production, ideally. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about how to get the most out of that uh, in a few minutes here. But the IRAC code is UNB, uh, which means that it's a bacterial, a non-BT bacterial agent with an unknown or uncertain mode of action. Um, it can be applied in the soil as well, but that's mostly for greenhouse application. I wouldn't recommend making any soil applications. Uh, it wouldn't really do anything for any known strawberry pests anyway. And it has a signal word of caution. So it's a very, um, a very soft chemical, uh, very soft on beneficials as well. So those, uh, those beneficial species of mites, I wish I would have added that data slide into my presentation, but we have data that suggests that Grandivo is very, very soft on all of those populations of beneficial mites and wasps. So that's uh, something to keep in consideration. You can make, um, instead of maybe a neonicotinoid, maybe make applications of uh, something softer like a Grandivo or Venerate to help with those populations of uh, ligus and spider mite. So the modes of action here are uh, the first one is agitation and repellency. And I think this is probably one of the most important things, particularly for ligus bug in in strawberry production. And the reason that is, is because um, for maybe for non mobile insects like a spider mite, it's going to agitate it um, and cause it to walk around the leaf. And the reason that is, is because it creates a, a surface uh, layer of 
kind of sticky residue that the insect doesn't really like to talk uh, walk on and they detect something's wrong so they try to move around the leaf finding areas that it's not there so coverage is really important with grand Devo. and for some of those more mobile insects like the adult ligus bug uh repellency so it because of that same reason they don't um, the ligus don't really like to come into the field as much and we see reductions in adult populations that can last up to uh, as, as long as 10 days with the, with the Grand Devo. And the second mode of action is ingestion. So once that, once that insect uh, does eventually take a bite, because it's going to get hungry eventually, it's going to uh, succumb to gut disruption. And it's going to cause all sorts of issues within the insect. Um, one of the most important things is it's going to reduce the egg laying, egg hatching, and fecundity of that insect. So this is where this is where Grand Devo has a lot of uh, misconception. I'll get comments like, "Oh, I sprayed Grand Devo, but I didn't see any kill." Um, well, first of all, the kill for Grand Devo is going to take at least five days, five to seven days for a kill. Um, you're going to stop feeding uh, pretty rapidly with the Grand Devo, but like I said, eventually they they will start again, and. What's what's important about Grand Devo to realize is that you're going to really start to see the reduction in insect population um, around the second application. And that second application is in my my recommended program kind of around week three of application. So the first week would be Grand Devo. The second would be a different mode of action, say, say like venerate. And the third would be Grand Devo again. And the reason that I say that is because when you make an application of Grand Devo, you are going to kill a certain population, a small por portion of that population of insects in the field. And then when they go to lay their eggs, there will be a reduced population. So then the following week, when you come in and spray with a different mode of action, you'll get additional kill of the population that did survive, as well as a kill on the population, on the reduced number of population that was uh, hatched. And then the following week, you make another Grand Evo application and you're going to reduce that population even further. So it really is a numbers game when you're using Grand Evo and strawberry production, especially for those really quickly reproducing insect uh, populations like uh, like two spotted spider mite um, or thrips, aphid, things like that. Um, it's, it's a really, really powerful product when when used correctly. And with that being said, I. There's a few things that I'm going to point out here out of this slide. I talked about a lot of them, but the first is that the Grand Evo has a long residual and strong UV. So that residual is seven to 10 days, which for an organic is, is fairly long. And you don't want to use this product before a rain. It's kind of a waste of money because it, it needs to stay on the leaf surface and it can be easily washed off. And with that being said, the, the most important thing I tell people when using Grand Evo in strawberry production is the volume of water used. Very common for growers to go out and PCAs to go out at 150, maybe 200 gallons per acre. And a lot of the reasoning behind that is increasing humidity, getting good coverage, um, a lot of different reasons why uh, reducing dust and spider mite population. However, with Grand Devo, it's better to go at a much lower volume, water volume. Um, I recommend about 100 gallons per acre if you can get there, 150 max. The, the best results I've seen are between 50 and 100 gallons per acre. So if you have access to something like an electrostatic sprayer, that's even better. I've heard growers going in with 30 gallons per acre with their electrostatic sprayer at three pounds to the acre and getting excellent results. So um, to improve coverage, you're going to want to use a good surfactant or an oil with that and and make applications regularly alternate with another mode of action. But make sure that you're you're using Grand Devo at least once every 14 days or so. And you're going to really start to see a reduction in these insect populations um, through both repellency and reduction in uh, future generations. So I want to go back a little bit to that JEDAG product that I talked about earlier. And I mentioned before that it can help to control spotted wing Drosophila. And so when 
We talk about SWD. Uh, we talk about the ripe fruit that SWD likes to go and lay their eggs in. They overposit their eggs into ripe fruit. But what we found is that it's not necessarily the fact that the fruit is soft. It may help that the fruit is soft, that the female's attracted to that piece of fruit. But what it's really attracted to is the yeast and bacteria that's growing on top of that fruit. So by using JEDAG as a sanitizer, you come in once a week with JEDAG, tank mix it with some Grandivo, and you're sanitizing that fruit from uh, things like botrytis and other yeasts and funguses that could be growing on that fruit. And it's going to make it less desirable for that SWD to lay its egg. So in the, in the chance that it maybe you didn't get good coverage or whatever, and the SWD does go lay that egg in a fruit, you have that Grand Evo as a backup plan. It's got a long residual. It's sitting on the plant waiting for that larva to come out, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to pretty effectively kill that larva as it eats its way out of that fruit. So this program has actually been very, very successful in cane berries. Um, we have a lot of anecdotal data supporting it in strawberries as well, but we're still uh, putting trials together for this in strawberry, but it, it is very promising in blueberries and raspberries and blackberries uh, already uh, with data supporting that. So the concept should still be the same in strawberries as well. So uh, to go over that program uh, again, the JEDAG is going to be three to four quarts per hundred gallons. Uh, an easy way to think about that is just a 1% volume to volume of the JEDAG. Uh, making sure that you get really good coverage throughout the uh, throughout the field. Using a good surfactant will help that uh, and also increase the contact time of the JEDAG, which is going to increase the efficacy of the product. And then mixing it well with a long residual product, uh, insecticide product like Grandivo. Um, I know um, there's some other products that are commonly used as well and rotated with Grandivo. Uh, some being venerate, others, uh, you know, maybe in trust, some other products as well. Um, I'm also seeing this being very effective in uh, conventional farming practices as well. So uh, mixing and rotating with, um, you know, malathion and uh, organophosphates and some things that SWD is becoming very resistant to can be can be helpful. And in some cases, those those conventional growers are ditching their conventional pesticides as a whole and just going with this program. So uh, we're seeing good results and I, I encourage people to try this. So the next insecticide, our second, our um, only other insecticide that Marone's currently offering right now is Venerate XC, and that's a Burgolderia rhinogensis. And the application rate for Venerate is two to four quarts per acre. It's um, more of a uh, contact insecticide, but we're finding that there's uh, actually more residual effect than we had originally thought. So we're still learning a lot about the M, uh, the mode of action, which is why it's still a UNB, um, just like Grandivo with unknown or uncertain modes of action. We're still learning a lot about it. And uh, I feel like I'd do a disservice trying to explain the new data we have because it's so new to me. Um, but the application methods can be used in the soil as well. It's not a systemic product, so it'll be targeting soil-borne uh, insects, which we don't have a lot of in California for strawberry production, but it can help with those as well. Um, I've heard some people using this in the drip for thrips um, with some varying degree of success, so uh, take it for what you will. Um, with and this has a signal word of caution as well, so it's a soft a soft material. Um, all of our products, uh, besides JEDAG, are um, for our minimal PPE. Um, all of our products, including JEDAG, are four hour REI, uh, zero day PHI, and MRL exempt, and OMRI's listed, of course. So. Uh, some of the best practices for Venerate kind of echo what I was saying about Grandivo. Um, watching that overall volume per acre, you don't want to wash out the product. Um, you want to keep a fairly high concentration of the product in the tank. So if you're going higher volumes of water, use more of the pro uh, use more product in the tank. Go more towards the max label rate, and uh, don't, you know try to avoid runoff um, when you're going and spraying throughout the field. Uh, alternating with other chemistries is important as it is with all IPM and um, using a good surfactant as well. 
Another thing I didn't mention, I don't think, when I was talking about Grand Devo is we recommend a, a tank pH of five to, between five and seven, which uh, is going to help the efficacy of these products as well. My this is just kind of a proposed program. Um, you know, being a PCA myself, I I always put this at the bottom, saying that you know I recommend rotating and tank mixing with other modes of action, other products from other companies. This is just something that I can speak to directly because these are our products. But basically, what I would suggest is going at planting a um, well first pre-plant dip with the regalia at a half a percent volume per volume you can also chemigate that in at a gallon per acre um you can if you're chemigating it in um you can also mix that with the jet ag uh one to three gallons per acre uh if you're direct if you're injecting it a hundred percent solution jet ag you can go that one gallon per acre. However, if you're um, you know, pre-mixing it in a stock tank of 500 gallons, let's say, you may want to go towards that more like three, three to five gallons per acre, um, just depending on how much water you're mixing it before injecting it into the field. Uh, keeping a higher concentration is really important when using Jet Ag. Um, so you can always reach out to me and I can help walk you through the, uh, the logistics behind that as well. So one or two weeks after planting, going in with a Stargus soil application, two to four quarts per acre, or soil application should be four quarts per acre. Um, and then as for a foliar program, rotating the Stargus at two quarts per acre, and then rotating with a tank mix of Jet Ag at half a percent volume to volume, with Regalia at one to two quarts per acre. It's an excellent program for, for uh, disease control, foliar disease control. And then with the insecticides, just on a seven to 10 day interval, rotating the Grand Devo and the Venerate at the um, label rates, keeping the Grand Devo at the two to three pounds per acre rather than that one pound per acre as uh, suggested on the label. So with that, um, you guys can always reach out to me with more questions, but I'm going to pass it on to my colleague, uh, Melissa, to discuss some of the data. And I'm going to be pushing through for her. So Melissa, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Thank you so much, Taylor, for that wonderful introduction to the bioinsecticides that we offer here at MBI. As Taylor mentioned, I'm Melissa O'Neill, Senior Product Development Manager, and I have the pleasure of speaking with you today about some of the data for our bioinsecticides. We'll start with Ligus, since that was a hot topic in Dr. Zukoff's presentation. On the current slide you're looking at, please look in the upper right-hand corner and you'll see a treatment timing table there. For this present study, there were four treatment timings, which are A through D, and you can see below that those were all during the month of November 2020. The research was done in Oxnard by Dr. Holden, David Holden, on the Pertola variety of strawberry. On our Y axis, we have the number of unmarketable berries that were harvested per 10 plant plot. Looking at our untreated control in the brown bar all the way on your left hand side, we can see that that number of unmarketable berries was about 11.5. Shifting your eye towards the right, we'll look at the standard material, which in this study was Pyganic EC 5.0. The rate was 10 fluid ounces per acre, and that was applied at A through D, which is all four treatment timings in that table above. What we did was a biofocus program. A biofocus program is what we at Maroon Bio Innovations call a program where we incorporate one of our bioinsecticides with another organic material. So in this case, we looked at Grandivo WDG, the rate of two quarts per acre, and we added that to the Pyganic, which was the standard, at the same rate as the standard was, 10 fluid ounces per acre. And that combination was applied at all four treatment timings. And what we noticed there was a lower pressure compared to what we saw in Pyganic by, by itself, excuse me, and this biofocus program had the lowest number of unmarketable berries per 10 plants out of all treatments in the study. We'll move on to our next slide now. where we will talk about Ligus again. It's the same study, so you'll notice that the treatment timing table in the upper right-hand corner is the same. Details the same again with the researcher in variety. Percentage of marketable 
marketable berries on the y-axis this time. So looking at the untreated control, that was only around 15%, the brown bar there on the left. Pyganic EC, 10 fluid ounces per acre, all four treatment timings, brought that up about 40% marketable berries, heavy pressure in the study. With the BioFocus program that I had discussed before, that Grandevo WDG 2 quarts per acre plus the Pyganic EC, 10 fluid ounces per acre, all four treatment timings, the percentage marketable went up to a little above 55%. And that was the highest out of all treatments in the study, definitely higher than Pyganic alone and a vast improvement over untreated control. Moving on now, we'll talk about two-spotted spider mite. As Dr. Zukoff mentioned, it can be a very challenging pest to control in conditions such as high heat, high dust, or when you are facing insecticide resistance or miticide resistance in this case. So the current research was conducted with Apex Ag research out of Santa Maria in the 2020 year. The number of mites per 10 leaflets on the y-axis. If you take your eye to the bottom of the screen, you will see in the legend that there were three different sampling dates, dates which are in gray, the 13th of May, blue, the 4th of June, and 11, uh, I'm sorry, and yellow, the 11th of June, 2020. Thank you for bearing with me. In the untreated control, which is the cluster of bars all the way on the left, we can see that the pressure of mites per 10 leaflets was highest on the first sample date and decreased slightly over the next couple of weeks. However, it ranged between 11 and 7. Nialta was the standard in this case. 13.7 fluid ounces per acre applied four times on about a week interval during May through June. Nialta had a fluctuating number of mites per 10 leaflets that was always below what was observed in the untreated control, but it kind of peaked on the 4th of June there and went down on the 11th. Looking all the way to the right, the cluster of three bars is Grandivo WDG, and the rate was two pounds per acre at the four treatment timings, about a week interval between them. Grandivo had the lowest number of mites per 10 leaflets out of all of the inclusions in the study. It was slightly lower what was, than what was seen in Nialta for all three treatment dates, and both were far below what were seen in the untreated. Next slide, please. Now talking about two-spotted spider mite in a different East Coast venue. Biological Applied Research Incorporated out of North Carolina did this research for us, and this study really focuses on different gallon inches per acre. So we'll keep that in mind as we look at the data. On the y-axis, marketable fruit harvested in pounds. Untreated control, about 20 pounds per plot there. That's the brown bar all the way on the left. Now we'll start with Grandivo WDG, two pounds per acre at 50 gallons per acre, A through F timings. So there were six treatment timings in this case. Much higher marketable fruit in pounds harvested with that about 110 pounds as compared to the untreated. Now notice that gallonage per acre, 50 gallons per acre. That was the top performer out of all of the cases here. Next, Grandivo WDG, two pounds per acre at 100 gallons per acre. Still the six treatment timings, that's the middle red bar there. And we saw a bit lower of marketable fruit harvested there um, below what was seen in the 50 gallons per acre. So that's indicating that that 50 was the best performer in the sweet spot with the gallonage. All the way on the right, the last bar is still Grandivo WDG, two pounds per acre, but the gallonage here is higher, 150 gallons per acre, A through F, and still about 80 for uh, marketable fruit harvested. So considering those three things, we saw the greatest efficacy at the lowest gallonage per acre here in the study in North Carolina. Next slide, please. Talking about spotted wing Drosophila, Taylor was on point by noticing that we were planning a lot of research in strawberry in the upcoming seasons, but for the current time we'll discuss spotted wing Drosophila in blueberries. A study done in Michigan State University during the 2019 season and on the y-axis are the number of SWD or spotted wing Drosophila larvae per half pound of fruit. You'll notice at the bottom of the screen, there's a legend and there's two different dates that the sampling was conducted in the gray, August 6th, in the blue, August 9th. 
For untreated control on the left, you can see those grouping of two bars representing the two dates and notice that between 40 and 50 number of SWD larvae were noticed in a half pound of fruit for those two dates respectively. Moving your eye to the right hand side, you can see the organic program that MBI included in the study, which was Grandivo with new film, which is a surfactant at A and C timings followed by Entrust at the B and D timings, and JEDAG was added in all four treatment timings for the study. And we saw on August 6th, about half the number of larvae per half pound of fruit as compared to the untreated control. And the same trend was continued in the blue bar for August 9th. Moving along, we'll talk some more about the spotted wing Drosophila. Still looking at some data from Michigan State University, although we'll see additional treatments in this study. Still the same metric, spotted wing Drosophila per half pound of fruit for the untreated control up there a little between 40 and 45. Moving your eye towards the right, the next bar in red is Imidan at 1.3 pounds per acre at the first and second or A and B timings followed by Grandivo at three pounds per acre at the C and D timings. And at that very fourth D timing, Admire Pro was added into the Grandivo. The rate was 2.8 ounces of Admire Pro. And that combinational program had 21% improvement over Imidan applied alone and was also lower than the untreated control. Speaking of Imidan applied alone, that's the gray bar in the very center of the slide. It's the same rate, 1.3 pounds of Imidan, but at all four treatment timings. So in having that program going on, we saw additional reduction of the pest. Now we'll shift our eye to the red bar that's closer to the right hand side of the screen, which is another program with Grandivo three pounds per acre added to 1% volume to volume of JEDAG, and that would be at the A and C timings, first and third. And it's alternated with a different program in Trust, six ounces per acre, plus the JETAG 1% still volume to volume at the B and D or second and fourth timings. That was a 33% improvement over the standard and trust applied alone, which is the gray bar all the way to the right hand side, six ounces rate of interest, all four treatment timings, a bit higher number of Drosophila per half pound of fruit compared to that program. So here's strong support for a program approach, which is always beneficial for insect resistance management. Moving to the next slide. I will turn it back over to Taylor and thank you very much for your time. Would you please enter any questions for me in the chat? Taylor, take it away. Thank you, Melissa. So just to kind of give a product overview here, um, you know, we have our we have a, a variety of products. Um, the ones that we've talked about this time were JEDAG 5% and Stargist. We talked a little bit about Regalia. Those are all of our fungicide products that will help to prevent disease in both soil and foliar. And of course, we have our insecticide line of Grandivo and Venerate that we discussed as well to de uh, decrease insect and mite uh, pressure as well. Um, Magistine is another option if you have some nematode issues. We have some pretty limited California labeling that we're going to get figured out by the end of the year, hopefully, but we are labeled for nematodes in strawberries. So if that's, uh, especially if you're a Florida strawberry grower, that's definitely a product you should be looking into. But in California, we don't really have that many uh, issues with that. Haven is our only non-organic uh, product that we offer. It's a sun protectant, something that we're still working with on strawberries. Um, recently just did some preliminary trials with strawberries on the coast here and uh, hopefully going to see some good results from that. So still still going, um, going strong with that product and learning about it. And then um, we have several other seed treatments and other uh, other products that uh, don't really pertain to this webinar. So with that, um, here is a list of the uh, Marone Bio Trusted team um, up in Oregon and Washington. We have Lois and Amelia, um, Northern California, Nick Steenikin. Um, I'm here on the coast. Alex Jackson is in the uh, Northern Central Valley and Doug McDowell in the Southern Central Valley. 
And then SoCal, uh, basically LA down and over into Arizona and Texas and Colorado is Brian Guess and our head of sales, Cindy Bishop. Um, as for the uh, East Coast guys, we have uh, Hal Blackmore and Steve Bogash and uh, John Driver and Brad Passion, as well as Matt Brecht for our Cultivated Garden line. So he, anyway, we have a, a very, very well-trained and dedicated team all across the United States, and you're welcome to reach out to any of us at any time and we'd be happy to answer any questions or direct you to somebody who could answer those questions for you. Um, as far as technical support, we have uh, Dr. Melissa O'Neill, who was speaking today, who's located here on the coast in California as well. There, her contact information can be found there. And in the PNW, uh, Marina and Brian Mueller and Dr. Tim Johnson as well over on the east. So uh, if there's any questions, I think we're having some issues with our chat, uh, but you can always reach out to me or anyone at Marone and we'll get you your questions answered. But we, in the meantime, we'd like to, I'd like to pass it along to Angela to do a little bit of a giveaway here. Um, looks like we're giving away a Leatherman and or a, a jug. Yes, and I feel awful because it looks like some of you are not able to put, you know, active act in the chat. So if you're not able to post in the chat, could you raise your hand? Um, if you're on your mobile device, the feature is probably on the bottom of your screen. If you're on your desktop, it's on the top of your screen. I just want to see how many people are struggling. All right, we've got a lot of people that aren't able to. Um, so with that being said, I think the only fair thing to do is just not do a giveaway because half the people can't participate and I feel awful. Um, I think probably the best thing to do is I hope you'll be able to join us for another webinar where we haven't had this problem in the past. So we're trying to figure out what the heck happened. Um, but uh, I think the fair thing to do is just proceed forward, Taylor. And um, we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, let's just do Q&A at this time. Um, and we're going to forego the giveaways. And if you are really upset about us not doing a giveaway, if that is the reason you came onto this webinar, please reach out to me. <laughs> um, and we will, we will make it right. But um, I hope you understand. I just want to make it fair. Um, so with that being said, now we're going to go into just just Q and A. So I did see hey, a Melissa. couple. Or um, yes, uh, sorry, Angela. I meant to say. Um, how about you just choose a number between uh, one and eighty, and I will I will find the person in the attendees list, and I will just we'll just give the give it away to that person. Oh, that's a great idea. There we go. Thanks for thinking of something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of solutions today. Oh yeah, we gotta. <laughs> okay, so let's go with number one in eighty. So let's go with forty-one. Forty-one. Okay. While I count that out, um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, and I think we're ready to pass on the torch to um, to our laws and regs. At, uh, geez, I'm spacing on the name, but. David, oh, David. <laughs> so just just let's make sure we have a couple of questions. Um, so there is one question in the chat that says, do you see degradation of peroxide with tank addition of Grandivo? No. Yeah. OK, yeah, I, don't, I don't know if Melissa has any more to to say about that, but I have not seen any degradation of materials. Um, no, the only the only thing you might want to be cautious of is using Stargus in tank with uh, with jet ag and that's um, you have about two hour period before it starts to degrade the stargus um, from what we've found so is that right melissa are we still going with about two hours sounds correct yes i just wanted to point out that the spud wing drosophila studies that i showed did incorporate grandivo with jet ag so that's what the question's pertaining to and 
no unintended reactions were noticed during the course of those studies, which are not only the two I've shown, there's other studies as well. So I feel comfortable saying that we wouldn't expect any negative reactions between the two. Thank you. Perfect. OK, and then I'm going to go if there's any questions, please post them in the chat for uh, those of you that can post in the chat. For those of you that have a question, if everybody that did raise their hand, if you could go ahead and undo that feature, just take your hand down. So you go back to the same feature you used to raise it and just click it again, I believe. Um, if there's anybody, yeah, there we go, sweet. Okay, so if there's anybody that can't access the chat, can't post into the chat, but has a question, I can unmute you, I believe. Just double checking. Yeah, I can unmute you. Um, so if you have a question and you want to raise your hand, just know I'm going to unmute you and I'm going to ask you to just go ahead and verbally ask your question. OK, so we'll try to try to make this happen because that's what we do in agriculture, right? We make it happen. So there I is saw, a real quick question ahead. that just yeah. came in the chat. Um, do these products work well with seaweed biostimulants and is there any data combining these products? Um, I'm going to let I have some personal experience, but Melissa, do you have any um, any experience from your end? I would say at least in the southwestern United States, which is the territory that I'm responsible for, we have not done those combinations. So I'd appreciate Taylor if you have some feedback on that. I will leave it at there may be some research in other territories with my PD colleagues, so there is the potential for that. Yeah, and um, you know, as as Angela mentioned when she was introducing me at the beginning of the webinar, I did spend some time with the KDNC plants, so I do commonly talk uh, seaweed to a lot of our customers now, and a lot of them are still using Acadian either in tank mix or um, in rotation with our products. And I can't say if they're making a big difference, um, but I would imagine, I know Acadian, or I, I should say, I know seaweeds are great products, and I know that our products are, are working, so combining them would only do more good um, than harm and it's commonly used together. So I would say that you're safe to do so as far as data goes. Um, I don't have anything that really supports anything I can talk about, but uh, it, it is safe to do and, and it is a good practice. OK, if you have more questions, don't be afraid to reach out to Taylor directly. Um, I'm going to go ahead and unmute. It looks like Marco has a question. So I'm going to go ahead and it looks like I can allow Mike. So Marco, let's see here. So Marco, you're, it looks like you're on mute. So if you, I allowed your mic, so now you have to unmute yourself. And you know what, you guys, if this, there we go, Marco. Yeah. Oh, see. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the presentation. Great information, you all. Quick question uh, on Stargus as being a bacillus. Are there, you know, with other active ingredients in the market, uh, do you see any differences in efficacy of Stargus against other products in the market? We found that Stargus is broadly compatible with other products in the market. And with relationship to efficacy on control on some of those diseases that you presented. Thank you. Yes, I don't expect to see any reduction in efficacy due to tank mixing Stargus with other products. We just looked at a few data on strawberry here today, and I don't think we examined per se Stargus tank mixes, but there have been Stargus tank mixes conducted on strawberry and other crops and where Stargus was combined with various materials. And we've never seen any physical or chemical compatibility nor loss of efficacy. In fact, we've seen the opposite, such as some sort of combination of Stargus and other materials, which we'd call BioUnite or BioFocus programs, often brings out higher control than do either product by themselves. Thank you, Marco. 
All right, awesome. There was another question that popped up in the chat. And um, while we answer that question, I just want to let here. Oof, I lost the. OK, one second. Fabio, I'm coming to you next. OK, so just be ready. So there was a question. Can Grandivo, Venerate, Jet Egg and Regalia be, Regalia be used in a cold fogger? I believe uh, Venerate and Jet Egg can. I don't think Regalia can. We have a text sheet on that. We need to get your information and we can send that text sheet to you. I believe we have a fogging <laughs> webinar next week, don't we? <laughs> we do. Yes, and a text yeah. sheet. Yeah, so we'll be sharing the text sheet in that promotion and you can certainly reach out to me directly and I'll be happy to give you the, the text sheet. But next week, uh, October 7th, same day, Thursday, we, it's a little earlier in the day. It's at 10 a.m., I believe. Uh, if you go to our website under the webinar section, you can see it. You can register for it. But the whole webinar is dedicated to fogging. OK, um, let's move. So I'm jumping in between two places, guys. Sorry, just give me a second here. So, oh, it looks like Fabio maybe disappeared if. Yeah, OK, so Ron, Ron, it looks like you have a question. So if you don't have a question, just unraise your hand so you you do the same thing you would have done to raise it so just otherwise i'm going to unmute you no it looks like he disappeared too all right i think real real quickly um i wanted to kind of tag off of what marco's question was and encourage well marco please reach out to me if you have any particular tank mixes in mind but i did want to mention that Stargus has outperformed several of the other Bacillus products um, that are on the market as far as efficacy goes at, um, in many cases, at a much, uh, at even half the label rate that um, the other products are at. And I think a lot of that has to do with Stargus having active uh, lipopeptides, which are essentially um, antimicrobial compounds that are naturally um, produced through a fermentation process. Uh, through through this particular species of bacillus. So uh, I just I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, a colleague texted me and told me I should I should mention it. So I thought I would. <laughs> awesome. And Ron, I un, I allowed your mic. So if you do have a, a question, Ron uh, Whitehurst, you can just go ahead and unmute yourself now and you should be able to verbally ask that question. Just give it a couple seconds. All right, it looks like maybe, maybe he doesn't. So you guys, if you have a question and it wasn't able to be answered here today, you have all of our contact information. So don't be shy. Um, we're happy to help in any way we can. Thanks for working with us through our technical difficulties. Okay, with that being said, let's speaking, go ahead. Yep. Speaking of technical difficulties, uh, you said number 40, correct? I think I said 41. 41, okay. Um, yep. Then in that case, it is Lauren Lanini, who is on the coast. Sweet. Uh, so Lauren, congratulations. Lauren, awesome, awesome. Lauren, so we'll need your um, contact information, your um, your mailing address. So you obviously don't need to put it in the chat because that's public, um, but just go ahead and email me, Lauren and we will make sure to get you the prize and tell us what prize you want the leatherman or the gallon jug um from arctic and then we are going to have one i can't unmute oh ron i took away here ron i i will allow your mic i stopped allowing your mic so ron try again try to unmute Sometimes it takes a couple seconds. Ron, you interrupt me if you can figure out how to unmute. I have your mic um, open, so you just have to unmute yourself in order to ask the question. So we're going to keep going, but if you can, you can unmute yourself and you still have the question, just go ahead and interrupt us, okay? David, are you ready? Yes, I am. Would you like me to share or would you like to share? Uh, if you could share for me, that would be great. You bet. Just give me one second, everyone.
All right. David, do you see the presentation? Yes, I do. Awesome. Take it away. Awesome. awesome. Thank you, um, Angela, for the introduction. Uh, first and foremost, my name is David Gomez, and I am on behalf of Gar Bennett, and um, I'll be covering the laws and regulations portion um, on this presentation. Um, and if we would go to the first slide, um, this particular slide will be going over pesticide safety training and hazard communication, um, basically just stating what employers do need uh, to be able to have uh, pesticide applicators on their farming operation. So uh, the first step, as you see in number number one, uh, post a written has a uh, communication program or pesticide safety information series leafly, um, also known as a eight. Uh, these do have to be read to the employees if they are requested, and they do have to be uh, presented in their familiar language. So if they are Spanish speakers, it has to be uh, given to them in, in Spanish. Um, and it does have to be posted at, at a central area. So anywhere employees do report to, say, early in the morning, you report back to a shop. These do have to be accessible for the employees and posted. Um, that way they can access immediately in case there is an accident or, you know, if they, if they just want the pesticide safety information. Um, number two, maintain pesticide use records in a central location. Of course, um, a shop. Uh, if, if you guys do have a shop or anywhere employees report to on a daily basis, it could be a break room, it could be a restroom. Uh, they just do have to be at a central location where employees do have access to them um, upon request or whenever needed. And number three, uh, maintain safety, uh, safety data sheets for uh, pesticides being used. So anytime there is an application being made, uh, safety data sheets do have to be accessible for all employees upon request and also have to be at a central location. So those are three steps um, as far as is uh, hazard communication. And this is a good example of hazard communication. And this is also known as A8, as I explained um, in the first slide. Um, this particular information, it will uh, provide safety information for all applicators. So if you see on the page here, it'll have an image of an applicator. So that's how you can distinguish uh, whether it's an applicator form or a field worker form. It'll have um, employer information. So for the employers, um, it does have to be provided. It has to be at a central location once again. And it does have a plan emergency medical care. So on the left hand side, you will see a blank, um, a blank, couple of blank lines where it says uh, name, address and telephone number. Those do have to be filled out specific to uh, the farming operation. So Whatever clinic you guys uh, use, the name of the clinic, address, and telephone number do have to be provided in case of an emergency or a case of, a, of an exposure of any type of pesticides. Um, all employees do have to have access to this information also. Continuing on with the <clears throat> pesticide training and appli application specific information, uh, the following does have to be posted. So post the following in a central location. Uh, proper area being treated the end time of application. So start and end time does have to be included on that. Um, any restricted entry intervals, so whether it's four hours, uh, 12 hours, um, 48 hours, it doesn't matter. They all have to have access to this information also. Um, and the pesticide product name. So um, any product that, that you are using, whether you're mixing three different products, all three products will have to be posted um, along with the EPA number and active ingredient. That way, uh, employees fully do receive all the information that is needed um, during the application. Um, and a copy of the safety data sheet is extremely important to have also. Um, in case there is an exposure and you, you need to see a physician or a doctor, um, they would fully receive all the information that is on the safety data sheet. And this does have to be uh, displayed um, within 24 hours of completion of the application. So at any time um, the application is actually finished, all this information does have to be posted uh, for the rem remaining th 30 days. Um, that way, all employees do fully receive all the information that they need and help uh, prevent an, an exposure or an accident um, during those applications. So we go to the next slide. Uh, pesticide safety training. Um, state and federal regulations require training before employees are allowed to handle pesticides. Um, of course, all employees do have to be trained um, prior to making an application, if they have been trained by a different company or a different employer that they were working at before, their, their current employer does have to provide this training, has to provide all the hazard communication, as we mentioned, um, and assure that they do have all the information that they need 
prior to making an application or um, any any type of job during an application. Um, start by deciding who could trade uh, your employees. So of course, a California uh, certified commercial applicator could provide them, uh, this information or this training. Uh, California certified private applicators, pest control advisors, um, UC extension advisors, or any other person that has had a train the trainer or um, is certified in to be able to um, provide this this type of information um, for the employees. Next slide would be uh, pesticide safety training. Uh, so this is in addition to the training. Um, trainings, trainings, of course, have to be provided before any um, employee does handle pesticide. Uh, train employees anytime a new pesticide is being used. Um, so of course, if you do realize that you guys have a new product that just came in and the employee has never been trained on it, they do have to be trained on the specific label or the specific pesticide that they are using prior to making the application. And of course, train the employees annually thereafter. So um, before their training expires, it does have to be updated. It has to be redone um, because it is just a, it's a regulation, uh, state regulation, California state regulation to be able to provide these trainings. If we go to the next slide. So the pesticide handler training. Um, so first and foremost, you will need a um, written program. So once you do have a written program, um, of course, you have to train each uh, employee on the pesticide or similar group of pesticides. Um, and all these all this information must cover precautionary statements about human health hazards, um, which will be contained on the label. The applicators a responsibility to protect persons, animals and property or their surroundings. The need for appropriate use, removal and cleaning of personal protective equipment. Safety procedures for handling, storing, transporting and spill cleanup of the pesticides and hazards hazards of the pesticides for acute, chronic and delayed effects. So each each uh, pesticide handler training must um, cover all these topics um, in the language. Once again, in the language that the employee employees uh, fully understand. So continuing on with the pesticide handler training. Um, the pesticide handler training also must cover all possible routes by which the pesticide can enter the body, signs and symptoms of an exposure, routine decontamination procedures for the employees, um, and that does have to be specific to the to the farming operation. So if you have restrooms or if you have showers on your farm, um, that has to be uh, discussed during the training. Um, that way, employees fully know what to do in case there is an exposure. Um, information found on the product safety data sheets, first aid and emergency decontamination procedures, how to obtain emergency medical care, and prevention uh, and recognition of first aid for heat related illness. So, of course, heat related illness is a major part um, of making an actual application because you are wearing lots of PPE. So, that is uh, something that does have to be discussed while you are performing a pesticide handler training. And in continuation to that, um, it also uh, must cover uh, environmental concerns such as drift and runoff, field posting requirements, potential hazards to children and pregnant women, and how to uh, report suspected pesticide use violations or other employee rights. So um, for, th for these last three slides that we mentioned, every single one of these topics does have to be explained, uh, once again, in the language that the employee un fully understands. Um, if they are Spanish speaking, it has to be provided in Spanish. They are English speaking, of course, they get they um, have has to be provided in English um, and must cover um, all these topics that we've mentioned in these past three slides. And part of the training, of course, is emergency medical care. Um, emergency medical care is extremely important um, in all applications, um, no matter how severe or um, minimal the, the, the actual exposure is. Um, emergency medical care does have to be planned prior. Um, to making an application. So whenever trainings are held, uh, make sure employers are um, providing the medical, emergency medical care that is needed. Um, so of course, uh, emergency medical care for all employees um, handling pesticides must be planned in advance. Uh, inform the employees for the name, phone number, and location of the emergency medical care facility. That will also be on the A8s, as we mentioned before. Um, on the second slide, that was an example of the A8. 
Um, so all that information does have to be provided for employees prior to making an application. Uh, post the information in a central or prominent location. Once again, it could be a shop or wherever all employees do report um, or have access to um, to fully receive all the information that they need. And also provide a copy of a material safety data sheet for any possible exposure. So once again, safety data sheets do have to be kept at a central location and easily accessible for all employees for this exact reason for for um, to well to be able to access in case there is an emergency in case something does happen. Um, all employees do have access to safety data sheets and um, can take a safety data sheet to a physician or a doctor whenever it's needed. And here on the right hand side, um, on the right hand side, we do have an example of an emergency medical care sticker. Um, these stickers are, it is a requirement to have posted on all spray equipment. Um, any spray equipment that employers use or employees use to spray um, has to be posted with this exact information. So it'll have the entity name, address, owner or supervisor's name, and contact information. That way, um, whoever is a, a first responder, it could be ambulance or a coworker, whoever gets there first, they will fully have all the information as far as the company that they work for. And then it'll have the clinic. So a good example of this one would be Valley Industrial and Family Medical Group uh, Incorporated. And then right underneath it will have the closest hospital to their location or to their essential location. So um, again, if, if you do have a central location, just look up the closest hospital, uh, put it on there, and that'll be most likely where the, um, that person will be transported in case they do need uh, medical attention. So um, reason why uh, we talk about um, emergency medical care is in case there is uh, a contamination as far as pesticides or an exposure as far as pesticides um, and also um, handle the decontamination specifics are extremely important also during a training that way employees fully do understand what is needed um, or what the procedures are in case there is an exposure. So of course uh, you want to ensure uh, there is sufficient water, soap, uh, and single use paper towels for routine, uh, routine washing um, that does have to be with the actual handler at all times. Um, ensure sufficient water for emergency eye flushing and washing of the entire body um, is accessible for the employees also. So uh, shower, um, if you guys do have uh, eye wash decontamination uh, stations, um, of course, that will be sufficient. Also ensure that the water is good in quality. Um, and the temperature is right, so it can be too cold, can be too warm. It has to be the liking of the employee, um, and it just is just really completely up to um, the employer whether they they want to provide the the water that that is requested upon the employee. And then the next one would be uh, one clean change of coveralls must be available. So anytime there is an exposure, the employee does have to have access to an extra pair of coveralls um, in case the, their first pair was contaminated with the pesticide or any type of product um, and more requirements for commercial applicators. So if you are a commercial applicator, there's a couple more requirements that are needed um, for those certain employees. Um, so if you do have any questions as far as that, as if you are commercial applicators, uh, feel free to reach out um, at the end of the, the presentation. And so on the next slide here, um, we will be discussing personal protective equipment. This also um, continue, continues the uh, decontamination procedures, if you will. Um, so here, um, employers should provide PPE required by the pesticide product label, um, provide for the proper storage, daily inspection and cleaning, repair and replace any damaged personal protective equipment, and assure PPE is used correctly for its intended purpose. So while you guys are providing these safety trainings or prior to making any application, uh, personal protective equipment is going to be extremely important. Whatever the label requires um, is always going to be the minimum. You could always use a bit more if you would like, uh, but you can never use less than what the actual label is requiring. If you are using less than what the label is requiring, it'll be um, inappropriate use of the PPE. You won't have sufficient PPE. There's more chance of a, an exposure to happen, more chance of an accident to happen. And of course, we don't want uh, DPR or anybody coming around and, and kind of just thinking you guys for not using PPE. So make sure all employees do have the right PPE. Um, they, are re they have access to the label. They can read the personal protective equipment that's required on the label. 
Um, and of course, they do have to wear it at all times during the application. So once again, personal protective equipment, um, wear chemical resistant gloves when mixing, loading, or applying pesticides, or when exposed uh, to application equipment. Uh, gloves must be 14 mils or thicker, also known as a green glove. So if you do have those green gloves, you guys are perfectly in compliance. Um, flog gloves or those with other types of non-separable liners are prohibited. And gloves used to make the fine adjustments to um, equipment or other activities that require high uh, dexterity must made must be made of any appropriate burial material. And gloves must be appropriate chemical resistant material also. So nothing to soak up any type of chemical um, while making an application or working on spray equipment. Uh, continuing the personal protective equipment, wear chemical resistant footwear or chemical resistant foot coverings when required. So that, that is upon request of the label. Whenever the label is requiring uh, chemical resistant footwear, chemical resistant foot coverings, that is mandated. Uh, wear chemical resistant apron that covers the front of the body from mid chest to the knees when required. Of course, this is upon request of the label once again. Um, and wear a chemical resistant suit that covers the torso, head, arms, and legs when fully and a full body suit is required. When a full body suit is required. So um, again, these these um, PPE this PPE is is required if 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 it is required. I'm sorry if it is required on the label. Uh, make sure it is being worn by the employee um, just to avoid any um, exposures or any accidents to happen um, because it is upon, requested upon the label. And the next slide, uh, PPE and heat illness. Um, of course, heat illness is extremely important while wearing PPE. Um, we want to make sure that the employees are reporting symptoms um, of any heat-related illness. Um, having a form of communication whenever they feel too hot inside the suit or inside uh, while wearing PPE or making an application. So uh, this type of communication is extremely important between the employers and the employees. Um, just that way the employers fully do know what is going on inside the field and how the employees are feeling while wearing the PPE. So um, if the abandoned ambient temperature exceeds 80 degrees during daylight hours or 85 de uh, degrees during nighttime hours, Employees are required to wear a chemical resistant suit per the pesticide label and must not handle the pesticide unless the pesticide is being handled um, pursuant to the list of exceptions found in the regulations or employees use cool chemical resistant suits or the employer provides engineering controls that effectively reduce the temperatures to an effective working environment. So again, um, on that last note, the employers provide engineering controls um, that could be an enclosed cab inside an enclosed cab if it is if it is conditioned and has a proper uh, ventilation system of course um, PPE is not mandated inside an enclosed cab so whenever um, a tractor driver is inside an enclosed cab uh, PPE certain PPE can be exempt um, as long as you guys are taking the precautions as um, as needed for, for the specific job that that has been um, held and of course personal protective equipment um, once again, employees must wear protective eyewear when mixing, loading, and applying pesticides by hand or ground rig, and when exposed to application mixing or loading equipment that contains or is uh, contaminated with pesticides. So anytime um, you are working with liquid pesticides, protective eyewear is going to be mandated, uh, whether you're mixing, loading, applying um, different PPE, such as goggles or a face shield, as you see on the left-hand side here on the screen. Um, will be requested um, upon the label. So whenever the label does request goggles or a face shield, um, that will be the specific uh, protective eyewear that is needed for that job. So um, there, there will be times where it does say, where it does say, um, excuse me, <clears throat> where it does say uh, mixers and loaders um, are required to wear label or uh, labels, um, goggles or a face shield, um, then that will be a mandate for the for the actual mixer or loader to, to use um, whenever performing that certain job. So again, uh, more on protective eyewear. Uh, appropriate protective eyewear must uh, provide brow and temple protection. That confirms the curvature of the face and the side protection of the eye, um, pretty much all sides. Um, if the pesticide label requires eyewear to be worn, 
but does not identify the specific type. The protective device must meet compliance standards specific in the American National Standard of Occupational um, and Educational Educational uh, Personnel Eye and Face Protection Device Code and can be either safety glasses that provide front, brow, and temple protection, goggles once again, as we explained in the previous slide, or a face shield because it does provide um, the temple, the eyebrow, and the eye protection that is needed. Um, if you do wear reading glasses, uh, reading glasses or sunglasses are not sufficient enough if they do not provide the brow or um, side protection. Um, so if you do wear glasses and, and you cannot, you don't have contacts or you cannot take your glasses off because you can't see, um, you will probably have to adjust with wearing goggles over your reading glasses or wearing a face shield over your reading glasses. That way you guys stay in compliant and avoid any any uh, fine as far as not being in compliance with protective eyewear. So PPE uh, exemption. So this is a, a huge topic also. Um, it really just depends on what the job um, is and what you guys are doing. Of course, um, working inside an enclosed cab can exempt a lot of PPE. Um, so of course, regulations allow for some exceptions um, and substitutions to PPE required by pesticide product labeling. However, employers shall assure that all exempt PPE is present and available for the use of work at the work site and stored in the chemical resistant container. So anytime uh, employees do, do not want to wear a certain exempt PPE. It does have to be provided. It still has to be access, um, accessible for the employee to use um, in case, you know, some sort of engineering control uh, malfunction or, or um, they, a certain tractor breaks down and has to use an open tractor. Uh, just make sure all PPE is, is there present for the employee uh, to use in case there is um, a certain hiccup during the actual application. So PPE exemptions, um, once again, chemical resistant gloves and protective eyewear are not required when applying pesticide, applying pesticides in an enclosed cab, using uh, vehicle mounted or towed equipment with spray nozzles that are located below, um, and the employees are direct, directed, <clears throat> and the employee and are directed uh, downward. So uh, nozzles do have to be pointing downward, it has to be below the employee, um, and uh, that's when gloves or protective eyewear will be exempt. Also, applying vertebrate pest control baits using long handled uh, implements that avoid actual hand contact with the bait. Uh, working in situations where the handler has no liquid contact with the fumigant or a fumigant, um, and using an application system approved by the state that is engineered to provide the level of protection that is equivalent to or better than required PPE. So, of course, those are closed mixing systems, which we will explain a little further into this presentation. So on this next slide, PPE exemptions, once again, uh, protective eyewear is not required when applying non-insecticidal <clears throat> non, uh, lures or baiting insect monitor, monitoring traps, applying a solid fumigant such as aluminum phosphide, magnesium phosphide, and smoke cartridges to uh, vertebrate burrows, and applying vertebrate pest control baits that are placed without being uh, propelled for application equipment. So those are also um, when protective eyewear is exempt. More on PPE exemptions. Uh, protective eyewear coveralls, chemical resistant gloves, and chemical resistant apron may be worn instead of PPE uh, required by the pesticide product label when using a closed mixing system to handle pesticide products with the signal word danger or warning. So PPE will be exempt from uh, this particular situation um, because closed mixing systems, obviously you won't have any contact with the actual product or you'll have minimal uh, contact with the product. Um, so which, this is why PPE will be exempt uh, when it comes to using a closed mixing system. And this also applies when using closed systems to handle dry pesticides. Um, Pesticide product formulations provided they they are packaged in sealed and intact water soluble packets and intact water soluble type packets. Uh, PPE exemptions once again uh, protective eyewear 
and work clothing may be worn instead of PPE required by the pesticide product labeling when using a closed mixing system to handle pesticide products with a signal word of caution. If you're filtering face piece respirator or dust or mist uh, filtering respirator is required by the pesticide product labeling, um, then no respirator is required to be worn inside the enclosed cab if the enclosed cab has a proper functioning um, air ventilation system. So um, if a N95 face mask is required or any type of respirator is required inside the cab, once again, it is not mandated. You do not have to use it if it does have a functioning air ventilation system. Um, if any other type of respirator is required by the pesticide product labeling, then the respirator must be worn inside the enclosed cab during handling activities. Uh, once again, if it's not a dust or mist filtering respirator, or if it's not a uh, filtering face piece, uh, such as N95, um, then it will be still mandated if, if you are inside the enclosed cab um, during the application. So respiratory protection, now that we were talking about filtering uh, face pieces and wearing inside um, enclosed cabs, um, employees must use approved respirators, uh, respiratory equipment in compliance with the state regulations when handling pesticides, uh, where respirators are required by the label, restricted material permit conditions or regulations. So anytime the product label does require a respirator and you do not have any engineering control such as an enclosed cab, then uh, respirators will be mandated at that time. Uh, the employer shall establish a written respiratory protection program with the work, work site uh, specific procedures. So, of course, if uh, the employees do get fit tested or they uh, go see a clinic prior to wearing a respirator, that has to be included in the respiratory protection program also. And a voluntary respiratory program may provide uh, respirators at the request of the employees or permit employees to use their own respirators for use on a voluntary basis. So once they are fit tested, once they do have um, access to these respirators voluntarily um, upon the employee's request, they can use their respirators um, regardless if the label requires it or not. More on uh, respiratory protection. Uh, the, resp the written respiratory protection program shall include uh, procedures uh, for selecting a respirator, so knowing um, how to choose a respirator, what specific respirator is required um, on the label, medical evaluations for employees, so any questionnaires or being medically cleared uh, by a clinic or by a physician uh, does have to be provided before using a respirator. Fit testing procedures have to be performed prior to making uh, an employee or making an application that requires a respirator to be worn. Uh, procedures for scheduling, cleaning, storing, inspecting, repairing, and otherwise maintaining the respirators. Um, that also has to be discussed with the employees um, and also training for the employees in the proper use of respirators. So anytime um, a fit test is being done, you can always just explain um, what type, how to, how to properly use a respirator, what type of respirator will be required for certain products, um, and just making sure um, all employees do fully understand what the respirator is there for. Um, and last but not least, training in the respiratory hazards that are potentially exposed during the routine and decon uh, emergency situation. So anytime there is an uh, emergency situation uh, with an employee and a coworker wants to help out, um, and that certain product does require a respirator, just making sure that the person helping out is wearing a respirator also just to avoid any contamination and exposure to the certain pesticide that is being applied. So here we have two different images of, of respirators. The left hand side, we have a 3M half face respirator with two cartridges. Um, and then on the right hand side, we have another example of a full face respirator, um, also 3M with two cartridges on both sides. So just um, basically just being able to distinguish what type of respirators are required by the label. Um, here are two great examples of two different ones that may be required on different products um, that you guys may be spraying. So pesticide toxicity uh, classification. So the toxicity is the, ca the ca um, capacity of the chemical to cause harm to your health. Um, the EPA has this, um, designed a signal word to help indicate um, to the user that the pesticide products uh, toxicity level. So um, I'm sure you guys have seen on all product labels um, have a either caution or warning or a danger signal word um, down the middle of it or 
in bold letters on the front page of a label. That's that will be the signal word basically distinguishing or, or telling what the toxicity levels are for that certain product. Um, and the toxicity level is determined by the acute short term toxicity data of the pesticide product toxicity to humans. So here on this on this next slide, uh, we do have an example of all the signal words. So on the left hand side of this column, we do have uh, caution, warning, danger or danger poisoning. Poison, <clears throat> caution being uh, slightly toxic, either orally, dermally, through inhalation, causes slight eye or skin irritation. Um, so, of course, because it is the lowest of, of all toxicity levels, doesn't mean that an accident cannot happen. So, um, I always tell my groups, um, treat a caution as if they were dangerous, because um, you just never know how uh, severe an accident can essentially be uh, while making an application. Uh, warning, being moderately toxic, either orally, dermally, or through inhalation, causes moderate eye or skin irritation. Danger um, can cause severe eye damage or skin irritation. And then, of course, danger poison being the worst of all, uh, highly toxic by any route um, of entrance of, into the body. So, of course, you want to be extremely, extremely careful with um, performing any application with the danger or uh, danger poison. Here's another good example of ca uh, category one pesticides. So highly, of course, highly toxic category two being the warning category three being a caution. Um, and of course, being the lowest, it would be category uh, four or five uh, being the lowest one. And of course, uh, the signal word here between the danger warning and caution uh, toxicity ratings, highly toxic for danger warning being moderately uh, toxic caution being the least toxic. Um, and then, of course, you have the le uh, lethal dose on the right hand side of this this image uh, where it says a few drops of it uh, to a teaspoon for a danger can be uh, lethal uh, for warning. It'll be one teaspoon to do, to one tablespoon. That'll be lethal. And then, of course, a caution would be one tablespoon to a pint or greater uh, for it to be lethal also. Um, so here's a good example of a. Uh, of a label. Um, this is a caution, uh, caution product, uh, Regalia and, and Grandivo. Uh, both cautions, it, you can see it um, clearly in, in, in the front of this label. Um, and of course, if you do see it, um, this will be the lowest of all of all the toxicity. So used to des uh, designate um, the lowest level of the human toxicity. And on this next slide, uh, we have examples of uh, labels with warning signs. So in the case of moderate moderately toxic material. So uh, if you guys do use any of these, just know um, it will say warning or aviso in Spanish um, in case the, the employees do want to know what what the signal word is. You guys could just show them the label and it'll have it right in the front for them. And then the last signal word being danger. Uh, the word danger used alone indicates that the pesticide uh, poses a dangerous health hazard, usually corrosive to the eyes. Um, and of course, it is it is extremely dangerous uh, while performing any type of application um, or spraying spraying application. So of course, kind of quick, it'll say danger, peligro, um, English and Spanish once again, um, corn harvest aid, defoliant, um, and of course, this is uh, this is all information for the employees upon request if they do um, want it um, prior to making an application. Signal words again, danger uh, can cause severe eye damage or skin irritation, not highly toxic um, if inhaled or swallowed. Um, danger peligro, once again, it'll have it in English and Spanish. Um, there are times where certain products do not have it in Spanish. So, of course, um, if a Spanish speaking employee or any other language um, is needed, um, it does have to be um, provided upon, upon employee request. So, if they do speak, English, Spanish, or whatever it is that they speak, it does have to be provided in the language that they fully understand. And once again, signal word, uh, danger poison. Uh, the wording always includes a skull and crossbones uh, symbol with, that indicates that the pesticide is highly toxic. So anytime you do see a skull and crossbones, um, it's most likely because it's a very dangerous product and it could cause uh, severe damage to the human health. So uh, closed mixing system. So now that we are talking about uh, danger products, um, usually danger poison products, for the most part, anything that can contain a skull and crossbone will require a closed mixing system. 
um, just to avoid any any uh, any exposure as far as the pesticide and the employee. Uh, closed mixing systems are engineering controls used to protect workers from dermal hazards when mixing pesticides with a high acute dermal toxicity. Dermal toxicity. Um, the employer shall assure employees use uh, an appropriate uh, closed mixing system when when such a system is spe specified by the pesticide product labeling. So usually the labeling on the product uh, will specify whether it needs a um, closed mixing system or not. And here's an example of the closed mixing system. Of course, the employee using it with his PPE, transferring liquids from a source um, container um, into the actual, you know, the, the actual closed mixing system. And then the closed mixing system requirements, um, all PPE is required by the pesticide label must be at work at the work site during operation of the closed mixing system and available in condition that uh, provides the intended uh, protection. So, of course, this is to protect the employee um, anytime the PPE is required or any certain type of PPE is required on the label. Um, of course, you do want to use it just to avoid any further exposure. Uh, protective eyewear must be worn while using a closing closed mixing system. Anytime uh, you are dealing with liquid pesticides, of course, protective eyewear is extremely important to wear. And all employees operating any such system shall be trained on how to properly operate the system prior to using it. So, of course, if a new employee um, is, is his first time using a closed mixing system, of course, he has to be trained on the closed mixing system prior to using it. And then a tier one uh, closed mixing system. Tier one systems um, are required for any liquid pesticide or adjuvant product bearing the statement fatal if absorbed through skin um, or other uh, comparable language. So, of course, if it's fatal, um, if absorbed through skin, of course, you want to have very minimal contact with or minimal to none um, contact to the, to the actual product just to avoid these situations. Uh, tier one systems must be capable of enclosing the pesticide uh, while removing the contents from its original container and preventing the pesticide from containing handlers, con contacting handlers, I'm sorry. And tier one systems must be able to rinse and drain the empty container as required by the product label while still being connected to the closed mixing system. So, of course, you don't want any contact with the employees. Um, that's why these this particular closed mixing system does have to uh, rinse the container uh, fully before the employee does disconnect it. So on this next slide, uh, we have a couple examples as far as the closed mixing system. So on the left hand side, you do see an employee has his uh, chemical resistant apron, his gloves, face shield, uh, which was most likely uh, required on the label um, and doesn't have any coveralls. So of course, a long sleeve shirt, Long pants and closed toe shoes always extremely important. Also, it is considered PPE. So anytime an employee is not wearing a coverall because it's not uh, required on the label, of course, you want to have that employee wearing at least a long sleeve shirt, long pants, uh, eye protection, chemical resistant gloves and closed toe shoes. And on the right hand side, um, we have another employee who doesn't have any gloves, has sunglasses on. Uh, but it also it just depends on what it is that's uh, being applied. So for this particular label, I'm assuming he did. It was no requirement to have gloves or a face shield or anything. Uh, but again, it, because it is a closed mixing system um, and it usually is because these products are fatal um, if absorbed through skin. It's always extremely important just to have your precautions and, and try to wear gloves as much as possible or protective eyewear uh, just to avoid these situations. And tier two closed mixing systems, uh, tier two closed mixing systems are those who mix liquid pesticides, not including adjuvants, um, bearing the statement may be fatal if absorbed through skin or corrosive causes causes skin damage um, or other comparable language. And tier two systems must be capable of enclosing the pesticide while removing the contents from the original container and preventing the pesticide from uh, contacting any pesticide handler. So, of course, once again, these uh, systems are to prevent any contamination towards the employee or exposures to the employee uh, just to avoid, again, um, the fatalness of, of the actual product.
and that is my presentation. David, imp <laughs> impressive job giving we were we were running over from the previous content. So <laughs> uh, thank you so much here. I'm going to go ahead and um, I'm just going to stop the share so I can view the chat. Are there any questions for David? I do want to say that um, uh, Giancarlo, I think that's how I pronounce your name. Um, you have a question in the chat about Stargus and its ability to control Corky Root. Um, I'm going to I'm going to totally botch that name in tomatoes. We don't have any data on that particular disease. I apologize. Um, if you'd like to discuss it further, please reach out to Melissa and she might be able to connect you with somebody that does have some products on that disease or might be able to to give you some additional insight. But she did say that um, she wasn't able to post it in the chat, but she we do not have any data on that disease for tomatoes. Um, if you have any questions for David, please post them in the chat. If you can't access the chat, just raise your hand and I will do my best to make sure your questions are answered. Of course, you can always contact David through Gar Bennett or just reach out to me and I'll make sure to pass your information along to David so that he can uh, respond to your question. It doesn't look like we have anywhere. I'm sorry, I'm sharing my, no, I'm not sharing my screen anymore. So what I'm gonna do is just go back to the presentation and one more time, just in case, um, these are our speakers and um, we have the contact information in the presentation for Taylor and Dr. Melissa. You can visit the Cal Poly Strawberry Center website to reach out to Dr. Zukoff. And then, of course, um, David is available through the Gar Bennett website. OK, and, and then uh, Marone bio website for all of uh, the Marone bio contact information should be up there, too. Yeah, thank you, Taylor. So if you go to our website, go to the upper right hand corner, I believe it says sales team, click on that and you'll see all of the different sales representatives and product development uh, experts and how you can get a hold of them. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and and I can't I can't post the, the survey in the chat. So um, I will be following up with an email later today that includes the link to the survey. And if you want to screenshot this or take a photo of this you can just punch in the url you know type it in manually and you'll be taken to the survey or the quiz for today's webinar so you can receive credit uh, remember if you don't take that quiz you will not receive credit okay um, and then you've got your your course codes here we will issue a certificate of attendance i've had a couple of questions this year asking if we submit to capca we do not um, however, we are investigating that and we will see if that's possible. Uh, so I apologize. We do not submit to CAPCA. We only submit to California DPR. Um, we sub and then obviously these other organizations, CCA, Arizona Department of Ag, and then some webinars we also receive, uh, get approved credit for Washington, Oregon, and we submit to those as well. With that, I would like to thank you so much for joining us on our webinar today. We have several webinars coming up in the next month as most of the United States kind of quiets down. Uh, so please stay tuned to our website under the resources section webinars. You'll be able to see upcoming webinars. You'll also be able to view past webinars. Uh, so if you miss one, you can watch the recording. Unfortunately, you won't be able to receive credit, but you can still gain the information. And as always, we're here to be an educational resource for biologicals. So don't hesitate to reach out, out to us with your questions or your suggestions. Um, we want to be able to help you grow the best way you can. So with that, thank you, Taylor. Thank you, Dr. Melissa uh, O'Neill, Dr. Sarah Zukoff, and then of course, David from Gar Bennett. Appreciate you sharing your expertise. Everyone have a wonderful afternoon. And for those of you growing strawberries, good luck with your crop this year. Take care. Thanks, everyone.